Hello friends, welcome once again to our program, I'd Like to Know. This is one of our favorite programs because we can have more interaction with you. We can know what is in your mind as you send us your questions. And today I have the privilege to be here with my dear pastor, Pastor C.A. Murray, Associate Speaker for Secrets and Seal. Welcome, sir. It's good, good to, to have here. you here. Good to be here with you, Daniel. And also, uh, thank you for being here with us. We receive a lot of feedback and a lot of questions. We have an impressive amount of list of questions, as you can tell. <laughs> and we will do our best to answer these questions in the order that we receive them, unless we see that a question needs immediate response. Before we begin, I would like to remind you also that you can continue to participate in sending your questions to the following email address, tv at samtv.org. Again, tv at sumtv.org. Send us your questions and we will do our best to answer them. Before we begin then, I would like to ask Pastor C.M. Murray to please lead us in prayer. We're glad to do so. Father God, again, we thank you for the privilege we have of studying your word. We thank you for the power in your word, for the direction that it gives us as we walk this road that leads to glory. We thank you for those who have questions and who are concerned enough about understanding the Word of God yes. to send their questions in. And so, Father, we ask that our studies might prove fruitful, mm. but more than that, that you may speak to us as you speak through us as we seek to answer these questions and give light and give uh, an answer where an answer can be found. Amen. We praise you and we thank you in advance for what you have promised to do and answer to the prayer of faith in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Okay, so we have um, a question that <clears throat> comes from Sidesa or Sidesa from Algeria. We sent you greetings, brother. And this is a, a very complex question, I would say, mm. because uh, we were talking before this program that we could record a whole program just on this. Yes. We'll see how, we'll see how far we can go. Um, the question says, he was in Sabbath school and he heard someone say that we are not born sinful despite our nature being sinful. sinful. Jesus was born into a sinful nature, but he never sinned. If we are not born sinful, then what did Christ really redeem us from by his death? That's his question. The sinful nature or what? Please <laughs> help me. I don't understand. Because I used to think that we are all born sinners. Then when we are born again, we get better. And that it's the natural sin at birth that Christ died for. Mm -hmm. So basically his question is, what did, they, what did Christ die for? What did he redeem us from? And if we are born sinners or not. Okay. There's, there's a lot there. Yes. And perhaps we ought to unpackage it, uh, my pastor, my friend, um, systematically. Yes. Uh, and, it, and it's going to take a little while. The first question, uh, dealing with what he, he is asking here, we are not born sinful despite our sinful nature. My, my first question before I even went to the Bible would be to ask him, if we're not born sinful, despite our sinful nature, when did we pick up our sinful nature? Mm -hmm. At what point in our growth pro process did we pick it up uh, if we weren't born that way? Secondly, um, there's a difference between sin and age of accountability. Right. And that's what he might be thinking of, that, that there, are, there are sins that I'm, I'm trying to unpackage this like an onion and not go too deep and have to come back. Mm -hmm. But at a, there's a point in time uh, when you, you are responsible for your sins when you know what sin is, and at that point in life, you become responsible for your sins. But did you sin prior to that? Mm. I think so. But uh, because of your knowledge, your ability, your, your, your cognitive ability, they were not held against you. Now, there's a whole other realm of things that we can talk about, and perhaps we should talk about that. Um, sinful propensities. Right. And sinful infirmities. Mm. And these come into play when you're talking about the life of Christ. Mm. Uh, we have propensities and infirmities. In other words, you and I have been born 6,000 plus years into this thing. We look at 
and sometimes we feel it. You know, yesterday, both of us, we were we taped a lot of programs yesterday, and we were kind of dragging around. Yes. You know, <laughs> both of us, interestingly enough, were sort of dragging around because we have the infirmities. Mm. You know, we don't live as long. We don't, some days you don't, you know, some days you get up, you feel like you can take on the world. Other days you, you get up and you feel like you're carrying the world. You know, it's just because of where we are in the stream of time and how the human race has declined uh, over the years. So we have these infirmities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then there are the propensities. Well, Christ had the infirmities. He, he, he came into this earth about 4,000 years in, and he, he didn't come in as Superman. He came in as a man um, with the, the infirmities of, 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 of men. He did not have the propensities. We come in with a, a bent towards sin. Yes. Christ came with a perfected relationship with his mm -hmm. father. But here's the question. Lest someone think that, that um, Christ had an advantage, my question is, is it harder to get clean or to stay clean? You know, you, 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 we are called to get clean. Yeah. Christ came clean, but his call was to stay clean. Mm -hmm. And in a sinful world, staying clean is just as hard as getting clean. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it is. You wash your car and you go outside and uh, if, it, if it's sunny or rain, uh, pretty soon your car is dirty again. Yes. You know, it's hard to keep it clean. Well, Christ had the job of keeping it clean. And he was successful in that. Now, there's a lot more I can say, but I, I think you actually do get to talk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I need to let you speak a little bit, and then I got some more stuff here. Well, I think you, you laid a very, very important foundation in this discussion. I think it all boils down into what is sin, uh, mm. according to the Bible. Mm -hmm. We got all this controversy about the nature of Christ and, and uh, victory over sin, and the work of salvation can be clarified if we have... Um, clear in our minds what sin is. Now, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, this is a well-known text, that sin, the Bible says there, that sin is the transgression of the law. Yes. So sin is the transgression of the law. Therefore, we understand that sin, if it is the transgression of the law, sin is is a choice. Yes. Actually, Ellen White says that the only definition, let me read it here from, from the Spirit of Prophecy. Um, this is a, a manuscript, a manuscript uh, 153, but this is also found in Selected Messages, I believe Volume 1. She says, after she quotes 1 John 3, 1 through 4, she says, this is the only definition of sin in the Scriptures the transgression of the law. So she defines that as the only definition. So some people say, what about James 4.17, mm -hmm. where it says that if he that knows what to do, the good that he and needs to do and he doesn't do it. It is sin. It is sin. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, that goes to the same thing. The only the, the difference is that there you have sin by omission. Yes. Uh, the person knows what he's supposed to do, but he doesn't do it. In that way, he's also transgressing the law of God. Yes. Okay? But anyways, so sin is a transgression of the law. Now, you said someone before the age of accountability is transgressing the law. Yeah. I mean, some babies and some kids are, are, are selfish by nature and, mm -hmm. and, and they are rebellious, but they're not conscious about it. Yes. And there is a difference between having a sinful, fallen nature and being a sinner. Yeah. And I often ask, yes. do we sin or are we sinners because we... Um, sin. Or do we sin because we're sinners? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you help me with that. <laughs> and, and that is, that is a, a tricky question that mm -hmm. can, be, can be difficult. But Very true. The Bible tells us that we are uh, in Psalm 51, 5, that uh, in sin did my mother conceive me. Mm -hmm. So the mother was the one that conceived me in sin. I inherit a sinful nature from my parents, but I become a sinner only when I consciously participate or partake yeah. of that sinful 
nature. Now that is the key, and I want to just mm -hmm. pause there, yes. Daniel, uh -huh. because you, I, I knew you were going to get there because I know you're a kind of systematic, thorough guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> because I wrote here, sin, sins, sinner, and sinning. Okay. Uh, and so I knew you are coming. And, and now that you've gotten there, I think we ought to pause. Okay. Because it's an, it's an important point that it you is. just raised. It, it is an important point that um, uh, we, we are sinners by nature. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, we are lying to ourselves, uh, and we make Christ a liar because mm. we are sinners. We were born in sin. In sin yeah. But there is the, the, the consciousness of, of, of sinning against the Lord. I mean, when a, when a baby is hungry at 3 o'clock in the morning, he doesn't care if you're sleeping. He doesn't care if you're uh, tired, if you've had a long day. He wants what he wants, and he wants it now. Sometimes he's crying just because he wants to see your face. You're mm -hmm. not hungry. Not, he hasn't sold his diapers. He just wants to sort of pull your chain. So he cries until you show up, and then he stops. He's fine. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, that's part of that, of that nature. Um, he's not responsible because he's not doing it uh, cognitively, he's just doing it. Yes. Um, but it, it shows the sinful nature which, which comes in with us. Mm. And then we, of course, are called to overcome uh, 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 that, that nature, that, those inherited, inherited tendencies to sin. So your point is very well taken. I just wanted to sort of pause it because you, you hit the nail on the head there. Yes, oh, thank you, Pastor. So when Jesus, we should not be concerned if we, if we have the right definition of sin, then it wouldn't be conflicting to us to say that Jesus took a fallen human nature because having a fallen human nature in itself mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't make you a sinner until or unless you participate yes. of that fallen human nature. And Jesus never participated. Jesus never had propensities or inclinations to evil that he had cultivated yes. because he never ever yielded in one particular point to any temptation. That's why he didn't develop those kind of uh, sinful propensities. You know, in the New Testament, there are at least <coughs> two words, there are more, that uh, are used uh, when it comes to sin. One is the word anomia, mm -hmm. and the other word is hamartia. Hamartia, missing the mark. Uh -huh, missing the mark, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anomia, ano a is without, Nomos is law, mm -hmm. so without law. Mm. Lawlessness. Lawlessness. Mm -hmm. That would be the, 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 mm -hmm. the most the correct translation, lawlessness. Anomia is lawlessness. And hamartia means in the mark. Now, when we come to the verse, 1 John 3, 4, it says sin, hamartia, is anomia. That's what it says in the Greek. Precisely, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, we see that even hamartia, is defined as anomia. Again, mm -hmm. goes, goes to the transgression yes. of, of, the, of law. the law. Yes, yes. So, we are not born um, sinners when it comes to the definition of 1 John 3, 4, but we are born with a sinful human nature. Yes. We're born with sinful propensities, infirmities, as you said, uh, and Jesus came to redeem us from sin. Now, we will have that falling human nature until Jesus comes, mm -hmm. okay? And when Jesus comes, we will be transformed uh, into a glorious body. Yes. But uh, we, it, we are not expected to be sinning until Jesus, come, uh, until Jesus comes because as Jesus overcame sin in the flesh, we mm -hmm. can also overcome sin in the flesh mm -hmm. uh, through the power of, of, of Jesus Christ. Yeah. If we are left to our sinful nature, we are of all men most miserable. Yes. You know, the good thing about 1 John 1, 9 is that he forgives us of our sins, Dan, and then he cleanses us from Amen. our sins. You know, if, if, he just, if he just forgive, 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 and never cleanse, and we become perpetual sinners, we're getting forgiveness, but we never get victory. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Christ died to give us, among other things, Victory, Amen. and it makes God kind of a toothless tiger. If yes. indeed uh, you, when when you and Kelly are blessed to have children, if you just tell them don't, and they affront you, they do it, and you just say don't, and they do it again, and you just say don't. After a while, they realize you are a toothless tiger. You know your <laughs> words are just words. There's nothing behind your words. You're just talking. So you actually encourage them in sin because you don't do anything about it. Well, you've either got to punish or to cleanse or to do both. 
God chooses to forgive and to cleanse mm. so that you are not you are not forced to keep on sinning. You get cleansing, but you also get strength to say no to sin. That's part of the, the process. Ellen White says this. Sin is an, an, an intrusion into mm. the universe for which no reason can be given. Mm. You know, I can't say, well, the dog ate my homework, the devil made me do it. You know, it just <laughs> doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Um, there's no reason for it, but it does exist. Yes. But praise God, we are not left to it. We can become victorious over it, and Christ gives us, gives us the power to do that. Amen. Amen. So it's, it's a really good question, and it's a question that has been asked through the years, down through the ages, because people want to know the nature of God, the nature of man. Uh, how do we deal with sin? How does sin affect us? I am so glad R Romans 8, 1, there is now therefore no mm, condemnation to amen. those who are in Christ Jesus. It's a powerful text, and it bespeaks God's power in us to overcome sin and amen. sinning. You know, in, in closing with this question, I would recommend my brother Siveso that you go to our YouTube channel to our website and you will find a symposium that our ministry did in 2020, uh, Last Generation Theology Symposium. In that symposium there are some presentations when it, uh, in regards to the, to the subject of sin, what sin is. Mm -hmm. So go there and also there are some town halls panel discussions and uh, people with different uh, opinions and, and, and input they discuss the subject of sin and some of those questions, and you will be greatly blessed. All right. This was a good question. You know, I, it, it, it tends to come up periodically, and that shows the importance of this question. Yes. Uh, because people want to know. Uh, and there are um, individuals who have uh, perhaps um, a, a, a not a full, full understanding of the question. So it's going to come again, and, and of course, we were ready to answer it as many times as that comes because it is, a, a, a it an, is important an important question, question and yes. a question that is vital to your understanding of the power of God to overcome sin in your life Amen. through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So we are, we are happy for, for that question. Amen. All right. So we have another question from Matthew C.D. And this question has to do with physical or literal Israel and the third temple. He says, is there any light either in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy about the physical Israel? Do you expect the third temple to be built as the Christian church, as the Christian churches teach? Thank you. <laughs> you know, lately, uh, this topic has been agitated. It has. Uh, especially now with Russia, again, coming into power in the political scenario, mm -hmm. uh, which is very linked to the rebuilding of the third temple. Um, I've heard recently that even the measures are being uh, taken to rebuild the third temple in, in there in Jerusalem. And many Christians are fixing their eyes in Jerusalem for the future rebuilding of the third temple. Does the Bible teach that? You know, there are some, depending on how you look at, at the temples, the first temple, the second temple, the third temple, there, there's so much controversy on this issue that some people say the third temple has already been built. That's because they, they, they look at Herod's temple, oh, which okay. was really a, 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 a reconstruction Correct. Uh, as the third temple. Um, I've had the privilege of being in Israel at least seven times. Uh, and, you know, to this day, I've been all over Israel. I've never been uh, up where the al aqsa is. I've never been up on the Temple Mount. I've been to the, the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall, but you are so restricted in your travels, mm -hmm. you, you really have to set a time and you've got to get permission. It's like traveling to a foreign country mm -hmm. to, to, to get up there uh, because of the mosque that is there. It is my opinion, well, I've got, I've got several. Um, the, the idea of a third temple is not spoken of in the, in the Word. Yeah. I don't see it. Two, it is not necessary to anything that's going to happen yeah. in, the, in the eschatological process as we see it. And um, this increased focus on Jerusalem mm. as, as an integral part of the end time scenario is not warranted and is not biblical. Right. 
uh, the next time we deal with Jerusalem, it's New Jerusalem. Amen. But this Jerusalem doesn't have any focus or real fulcrum uh, as far as the end time scenario is coming. If you're looking at Jerusalem, you're looking at the wrong city. Yes. Because um, it, 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 I don't see where it, the Bible says it plays a central part in, in the closing scenes of earth's history yeah. uh, to the extent that many evangelicals want to, to place it. Yes. I really like what you said about uh, fixing our eyes on the New Jerusalem. This, that's where we were, we sh we're supposed to be fixing our eyes. You know, some Christians miss what the Bible teaches about the literal difference between the literal and the spiritual. Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, we have a literal temple in a literal location. Now, in the New Testament, now the temple, um, I would say, adopts a spiritual connotation, and it is no longer referring to a literal temple here on earth. Why? There is a simple reason. When we, when we study about the temple or the sanctuary, what makes the sanctuary important is not the building, it is the presence of God presence in of the God. building, yes. in the Shekinah. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes the temple something important. Now the Jews of old made the great mistake of looking at the temple as their savior. Yes. Even before the Babylonian captivity, and Jeremiah rebuked them and said, uh, don't say the temple, the temple, the temple. Mm -hmm. uh, because the temple itself is nothing mm -hmm. if the presence of God is not there. So Jesus, when he came, uh, Haggai had prophesied about his coming to this temple, yes. which is Herod's temple or the second temple remodel. Okay, it's Zerubbabel's temple remodel by Herod, but it's the same second temple if, or if you want to, Count it the third temple. It doesn't matter, but it's, <laughs> it's it, Haggai prophesied about Very that. true. <laughs> and Haggai said that this temple was going to be greater than Solomon's temple. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the desire of all nations yeah. was going to be there yeah. in the person. The now, the Jesus was the desire of all nations, the desire of ages, and he stepped into this temple, but the true presence of God, the true Shekinah came and the people did not recognize him. Mm -hmm. They rejected him, and Jesus, the, la the last time he was in the temple, he said these words in Matthew 23, verse 38. Matthew 23, verse 38. This is what Jesus said. See, your house is left to you desolate. Mm -hmm. For I say unto you, you shall see me no more, till you, till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of of the Lord. So the temple lost its significance yes. when Jesus departed from the temple. Mm -hmm. Then now our eyes are supposed to be where Jesus is. Yes. And Jesus is now in the heavenly sanctuary. But there is a spiritual temple here that Paul referred to in several passages for, for the sake of time. I won't, I won't read them all, but 1 Corinthians 3.16. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes we apply this to the body, but in the context is referring to the church. Yes. When Paul says, don't ye know that ye are the temple are of the God. Temple. Mm -hmm. okay, it's referring to the church. Mm -hmm. Now in Ephesians 2.19 and 22, Paul refers to the believers as stones, spiritual stones building up the spiritual mm -hmm. temple. And the same thing, and, and this is this one I, I will read in First Peter chapter two verse five. First uh, Peter chapter two and verse five. This is what the apostle Peter says: "Ye also, as living stones, are are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ." Notice that word, that repetition: spiritual house, spiritual sacrifices. Yes. So. Uh, in the New Testament, the temple is seen more as a spiritual temple mm -hmm. made up of the believers. Yes. So when it comes, when it talks about the the um, the temple in the New Testament, and particularly in Second Thessalonians chapter two, that's where uh, some people base their prophecies about the rebuilding of a new temple because mm -hmm. there is a man, the man of sin, that will sit in the temple of God. Yes. That temple is the church, mm -hmm. the believers, the Christian church. It Correct. is not. Correct. A, a literal temple that will be rebuilt in Jerusalem. Right. And a nasty man is going to go mm -hmm. three years and a half later, and he is going to erect an image and defile the temple. Yes. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, a number of things. Um, in John chapter 4, around 21 through 24, when Christ is, is going through the dialogue with the woman at the well, of course, she, she is trying to throw a little smoke in there because she's trying to get him off of, uh, he's, he's sort of diagnosing her life and she's trying to dissuade him. Mm -hmm. And so she, she, she floats an old controversy, you know, where should we, we, we um, worship, in Jerusalem or in Samaria, you know? Uh, the, the Samaritan temple had been destroyed by John Hyrcanus and it was still in ruins. Uh, she said, but we, we, we like, like to worship here and uh, you guys worship in Jerusalem. And Christ said, uh, it's coming a time and now is, that's not gonna be important. Mm -hmm. What is important is worshiping him in spirit and in Amen. truth. So the, the physical place is not important anymore. What yes. is important now is that we worship him in spirit and in truth, mm -hmm. and you must have both. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we are, we're not putting emphasis on, and Christ did not put emphasis on, a building anymore. The emphasis now is on having Christ in your heart and you being the temple of the Lord. So it's, it's a very good question. I really appreciate your, your answer, Daniel. Uh, well done. Yeah, thank you. Well done. So uh, in the last minutes that we have, you know, again, I go back to, to what you said, Pastor C.A., because I think this is, this is uh, a basic teaching that we should get from the temple is that when you read Hebrews chapter 11, you notice that mm. even the heroes of faith in the Bible, they had their eyes fixed not on an earthly city, on an earthly temple, yes. but they all looked to a city whose builder and maker is God, mm -hmm. to the new Jerusalem. So there is a real temp temple in heaven, Hebrews tells us, in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, that Jesus is in the heavenly sanctuary yes. that was made by God himself, mm -hmm. that was erected by God himself, and he's there ministering for us. Mm -hmm. So we should fix our eyes on yeah. that temple and get hope and strength from Jesus Christ, Amen. who is interceding on our behalf Amen. in that temple. All of our energies, all of our hopes ought to rest in, in heaven. Whether a third temple is going to be built, and I don't see that as a biblical uh, truism, we said that, uh, is not really important. The thing that is important is that when Christ comes, you are ready to, to meet him. And you've lived such a life that prepares you to hear from his lips the well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well, our time has fast slipped into eternity. Allow me in closing to wish you both grace and peace through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye and God bless.